Welcome to the JarfCast, I'm Jeff, and today we're going to be exploring what's in my box. Jarf! So in my last video, I showed you my very first 3D printing project. Now let's take a look at my latest project. It's a bunch of parts, and when it's assembled, it's going to be the case for my new prototyping board. Now before we put it together, let's go to the thought tree and discuss how I came up with this design. All right, so I had this prototyping board when I lived back in Indiana called a cadet board. And it had like a built-in variable power supply and breadboards all around the middle. And it had a speaker and some logic high and low value lights, function generator, all sorts of cool stuff. And it was just the best. Besides my oscilloscope, it was my favorite piece of kit. And it allowed me to go from idea to design to prototype very rapidly. Unfortunately, when I moved to Texas, it had to go as with all my lab equipment. Just didn't have enough room in the U-Haul with three other people's stuff. R.I.P. Cadet Board. R.I.P. Oscilloscope. R.I.P. Bench Power Supply. R.I.P. Circuit Etching Station. So first I wanted it to have a similar form factor. I really liked the way the Cadet Board felt sitting in front of me on my workbench. Secondly, I wanted it to be modular. That way I could swap in components and tools as I need them or as I buy them. And third, I wanted to minimize or eliminate the need for additional hardware to hold the case together. Less hardware means I can spend more of my money on the parts. I also needed to figure out how I was going to make this prototyping bench bigger than my printer's print volume. And my first thought was cut the case into quarters and somehow fit them together. I could use glue, but I was worried about the durability of a case held together with glue. I thought about clips like you'd see on a shopping cart used to buckle in children, but I didn't want to spend all that time figuring out how to make that work in CAD. And I was also worried that the print would come out terrible. I did come up with these janky press fit little button things, but they're really garbage. So after shelving the idea for a few weeks, inspiration finally struck. I'll just make it slide together. I considered some different options for the rails that would hold the parts together. The three top contenders I called the lollipop, the T, and the V. I was most happy with the V because of the way that the forces would be spread out and encourage the parts to hold together. It wasn't until later that I discovered my V design it was actually called a dovetail and is already used in many applications. Then I needed to figure out my geometry, something that would be easy to print using an FDM printer. So that means no overhangs, more than 45 degrees. I ended up settling on 30, 60, 90 triangles for this shape, because that would allow me to use a two to one ratio for these dimensions. Next, I needed some test prints. I think I went through about five designs before I finally found one that I liked. Some things I needed to consider were, how much clearance do I want between this rail and the notch that's cut out for the part that fits down onto it? If that's too tight, and they'll just bind together and they won't slide past each other too loose, and the whole case will be wobbly. Next, I had to figure out how the slides would print in different orientations. This is important because if I design a part that won't print well in any orientation, I might have to start from scratch. So here's the different orientations that I tried. First, we've got the parts of interest on bottom. So here, you know, the slide is on bottom. And that one worked really well. That surprised me. I wasn't sure if the bridging on the underside was going to be okay or not. This one, I assumed it was going to fail really badly because you were gonna have these impossible overhangs, but actually it came out okay. And I think with a little bit of work with the hobby knife, they would have been fine. It turns out I didn't need to design anything to print this way, but I could have, and that's good to know. Then we have the pieces of interest on top. And again, I was concerned about these overhangs, but they came out fine. Same with this guy. These, I really had no hope for. I was pretty certain they were gonna fail, and they did. You can see the geometry on this one just is really bad. It, uh, there's too much unsupported overhangs, and really it fails horribly. This guy, and my lens is not very good at capturing a macro, but there's quite a lot of drooping on the underside here, and it almost looks as if it's layer shifted, but it's not. It's just that there is no support on the absolute bottom part of this rail, 
and so it's printing into thin air and it takes it several layers to kind of get a good grip going. Uh, these, where they kind of printed on their side, I expected them to come out very nicely and they did. These actually make for the best fits of all of the orientations. So for each part I'd start with my maker's notebook and I would draw the basic shape that I wanted to see. For the dimensions I would either calculate or do it up in CAD and just sort of take some measurements of where everything needed to be. This was the base and here's my bill of materials showing where I printed everything, kept track, and maybe made some notes. Most of the pieces I designed were pretty easy to figure out. I just needed to get the right dimensions and then insert the cuts or rails wherever appropriate. There was, however, one piece which proved to be a bit tricky. And this was the piece that fit into the perimeters right here. They had to have some pretty special cuts in them. And because of the relationship between the different cuts and rails, it was kind of tricky to figure out how I wanted to make this print. See, the biggest problem was that this rail needs to stop to allow this slide. And as you can see on this finished part, that geometry needs to exist on both sides. So there wasn't an obvious, oh, print it this way, where I could have this extending all the way to the end. Now, normally I'd want this to print on my print bed like that, but that leaves this completely unsupported 90 degree overhang. In the end, I ended up attaching some nubbins to come down to allow it to support a bridge across those nubbins. It actually worked really well and came out very clean. Now I can take it to CAD. Now I won't bore you with all of the details of how I made each different piece in CAD, but what I do want to show you is what it looked like assembled in Onshape. So there was originally going to be a middle piece here, but I didn't realize until after I designed everything that the cuts didn't extend correctly through these parts. So in the end I decided to leave it open for ventilation. We don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents. There were a few parts that I tested as I printed. For instance, my first finished parts I wanted to test to ensure that when I went from small scale to larger scale, it still slid. I also tested this back plate that's got the hole cut out for my power switch and fuse. I ended up having to redesign this twice. So the first time, there was not enough clearance for the piece to fit in basically at all. And the second time, I didn't realize I was gonna need to design a lip for these, otherwise the power cord would be interrupted by the tab being pushed in. Okay, so since all of the rest of that was recorded maybe two weeks ago, I have finally got it put together, but not without a lot of heartache. You see, depending on where the rails slid into the cuts, the clearances were either more or less because of the way that 3D printing works. So like, for instance, anything that was on top, there was some slight droopage in these overhangs. Anytime it was on bottom, there was quite a lot of drooping from the bridging that occurred, so I had to cut out all of the bottoms anywhere that it printed straight up and down and just really tear the crap out of it. You'll see some B-roll here, which shows me doing that, having to just destroy a couple of different of my hobby knife blades trying to get all of that cleared out. Then the clearance was just still too tight in a lot of places and so what I had to do was reprint all of the rail pieces, all of these sort of intermediate bits, just reprint them like two or three different times with different tolerances and then I had a sure. lot of a time getting it all together. You'll notice that there are quite a bit of broken bits. This is all crushed in. Um, there's some on the back here. You'll see some more B-roll showing all that off with some stills that I took. Anyways, it's together. I did not get any footage of me putting it together because frankly, as soon as I finally got it all to slide together, I, I, I just was done trying <laughs> to get it captured on camera. There's some spots that still are not good, but it's together. And I'm gonna keep trying with the board the way it is. Now, there will for sure be a Mark II of this that I design with some of the limitations kept in mind. Um, I might make some of this a little bit thicker to increase the strength on especially these areas that broke off. So right now I think these are all maybe 10 millimeter thick pieces and I might, yeah, 
increase that to 15. Again, to add a little bit of strength in some of these parts that just couldn't hack it. Because, I mean, if you look down at them, there's only maybe a millimeter, half a millimeter of contact area. And that's just not enough for this cheap PLA to really adhere and not be brittle. So that's where it's at. And there will be more videos as I am able to get some of the modules built. I've already had a whack at where the breadboard goes, but that also was kind of a failure because I forgot to keep some dimensions in mind when I created these. Um, I mixed up a couple of measurements and well, it's too thin. And hopefully sooner than later, we'll have some projects ready to prototype on this. But for now, I'm Jeff, you're watching the Jarfcast.